Hello everyone, welcome once again to Shady Oak Ministries. Today we're going to be beginning a new subsection and series, being that we've started Disney. I suppose this would fall under topic. But today we're actually going to be discussing something that's probably near and dear to most of your hearts. We have been discussing themes like My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, we've been discussing things like anime, we've even gone into Disney princesses and the biblical themes and parallels therein, but let's be honest, we're all nerds at heart. And especially in the American culture, if for those of you who aren't Trekkies, probably began your career in the sci-fi lore and genre of nerdistry in the topic and study of Star Wars. And thankfully, one of you was able to reach out and request this. I was more than happy to be able to present this as a topic to you because not only in a fact that George Lucas himself confirmed that his inspiration for some of the names, themes, and concepts that made up Star Wars as a whole to him were taken not only from the already pre-existing science fiction lores, but also from a marketably more ancient topic known as Jewish mysticism. Now there is a distinction between Christianity, Judaism, and these mystical ideas. It was more of the rabbis letting their imagination go a little too far away from them. A number of the books of the Apocrypha were actually based off of these topics and they are not recognized as biblical. But if you were to actually look into these things, we're going to be seeing little hints and bits of parallels to Christian scripture as having a direct correlation to some of the things. And in minor ways, we have Luke as being Paul's physician and the writers of the Gospel of Luke, and as well the book of Acts. We have Princess Leah. Leah was the second wife of Jacob and the last surviving one who was uh, the mother and progenitor to most of Israel's sons. There's a name of a number of planets like Endor, which was mentioned in 1 Samuel chapter 29, where Saul's reign of tyranny and madness was actually put to an end. We'll talk about more on that when we get to episode 6 in that study. And as well, Obadiah, which was mentioned in the Star Wars The Clone Wars Cartoon Network rendition TV series, has actually been taken verbatim from one of the Old Testament minor prophets. But all of these things in mind, I not only want to point out to you the minor similarities between the biblical accounts and themes as being the inspiration for every story that's been worthwhile, but most of all, the fact and the very foundation of what this channel was founded upon is there's only ever been one story worth telling, the story of the Messiah, the promised and anointed one that would come to not only put an end to evil's power and take away its authority from our lives, but replace it with something better. And this, of course, me, myself speaking about Jesus Christ, we want to tie these things back in as many realms as possible, of which he and his Holy Spirit will allow us to. And I encourage you, even if you're not a Christian, but simply a Star Wars fan, to listen to and hear out these themes and parallels. Now, Star Wars Episode Four is where we're going to begin, as naturally when the series started. I'll be going through the original trilogy as well in the fourth through sixth studies, and even more so regrettably, we will be going through Episode Seven as well. That, of course, being my personal opinion, I'm sure God's going to use it powerfully, but if you want to hear the themes that could even be taken out of the abomination that is Jar Jar, trust me, God's used donkeys to speak his truth before, and he still continues to do so to this day. But with this in mind, I want to overview and focus on with you the first Star Wars movie that hit the big screens. In Star Wars Episode Four, we essentially see the overarching theme and plot line as a complete copy and paste, and I'm not saying that in condemnation, in fact, it's the very reason why I got into it, of Matthew chapters 2 and 3 from verses 23 all the way into the next chapter in verse 17. Now I won't take the time to read those to you all in just one hit. We'll take these themes and events one at a time and explain them as we go along. But I want to encourage you, if you have a Bible or you have a tab available and to be opened that your internet is able to maintain, bring up these passages in websites like Bible Gateway, whatever translation works. I'll be reading out of the New King James as well as this other mysterious book, which I'll tell you its origins here in a minute. But noting that the plot line of Star Wars could simply be defined as this, that a boy by the name of Luke, early, late adolescent, 
is on a desert world called Tatooine, and from his early infancy all the way into his teen years, he is there wondering what his purpose is going to be. Now, after the Empire comes and massacres innocent Jawas and his foster parents, he is taken in by Jedi Master Obi-Wan Kenobi to the fourth moon of Yavin, after being detoured from the planet of Alderaan, and of which to do this, to fulfill his destiny and to put an end to the Empire's use of the Death Star, holding the galaxy in their grip through fear. Now, taking all these things into hindsight, that being basically, if you were to go on to the bunny parodies and see Star Wars in 30 seconds, or you were to see a parody rendition of uh, like the lore uh, comedians that you would find on YouTube, and you would have to find the briefest summary, that would probably be how you define it. But let me actually point out to you probably where we could find these things in even more brief and even more direct and significant rendition. Now for those of you who are familiar with the Christmas story you would know that the birth of Jesus Christ and the virgin conception of that being through Mary wasn't the only significant event that happened historically on that day. After the three wise men found Jesus when he was in his early infancy, probably two to three years old at the time, they were looking for him for a while. They presented them their gifts and went on their way. But after being divinely warned in a dream not to inform the man in charge, whose name was actually called Herod the Great, this was actually a comedic note because the dude was around like four foot seven. He was not only very stumpy, but he was very paranoid. And uh, Romans would actually joke that it was safer to be Herod's pig than Herod's son because he was uh, Edomite, yes, but he practiced Jewish customs. He wouldn't eat pigs, but because he had murdered so many of his own children in fear of them conspiring to take his throne, you could see a slight parallel. And we'll go into more details as to Palpatine and what his illustration is actually meant to be. Most of you probably know it already. But the inspiration for all of these things and the circumstances surrounding his birth actually go a little bit more into episode four than we'd give it credit for. So, with all of that said, I want to read to you two verses here. Matthew 2, 13 through 15. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt, and he was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I called my son. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with the differences between the various Gospels, the special and significant eyewitnesses accounts of Matthew and John, and as well the first-hand information from eyewitnesses that Luke received by interviewing all of the eyewitnesses, and Mark actually being a first-hand renditioner of Peter's account, you could call Mark the Gospel of Peter, all of these things were pointed out to us in very specific ways. Mark was an overview of the events of Jesus' life. Just, this is what happened, this is who he was, this is what he did. And ultimately, just what is the significance of this guy named Jesus? Why do we all believe that he was God? The second to be written was Matthew, and Matthew was written to a primarily Jewish audience. These would be people who grew up going to synagogue, people who grew up in the Hebrew language and the Hebrew culture, were immersed and basically, they learned to read from the Torah. They learned their ABCs through Psalm 119. These were Jewish folks. And when Matthew would take the time to say, fulfilled by the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son, as well as other prophecies that we'll be reading about, he'd be referencing Old Testament prophets and passages that would be fresh on the minds of these people as being messianic and how Jesus was the fulfillment of the Jewish Messiah. And again, briefly, Luke was speaking to a Gentile, a Greek audience, so he would focus more on the physical and human nature of Jesus while also confirming his deity and then John emphasized the doctrine of why we believe that Jesus was God, picking seven specific miracles that confirmed him and his deity during his life from an eyewitness account. 
But all these things being pointed out to us, this first passage here is actually a reading of Hosea chapter 11 and verse 1. Now instead of taking my, my New King James Bible here and reading it to you, my preferred translation, I actually want to take you to the original sources. Because when we started this video, I mentioned that uh, George Lucas's inspiration, the main one anyway, was Jewish mysticism in dis discovering and uh, emphasizing the concepts of what Star Wars is all about. The Force compared to the Holy Spirit and the emphasis of the spiritual realm being a parallel of life and death and the human emotions and the balance of the world and the nature of the fall and the rule of the dark side, all that stuff. But what I have here with me, this impressive looking book, is actually from the Jewish Publication Society. This is a, ironically and marketably, non-Christian non piece of literature because this is what you would call a Tanakh. And a Tanakh is actually what the uh, Orthodox Jews, the people who follow Judaism and have a Jewish bloodline but don't necessarily recognize Jesus as the Messiah. This is a record in an archive of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, also called the Pentateuch. It is a collection of Jewish history from Joshua all the way to 2 Kings and First and Second Chronicles as well, when Israel is refounded after the Babylonian exile. And as well, the Hebrew poetry, including but not limited to the Psalms, Ezra, Esther, or Ezra wasn't poetry, that was history, uh, Esther and Job, and as well the collection of the prophets, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, and the rest. But this being, in a sense, the Old Testament for Christians, it is the collective works and Bible of the Jews. And the Jewish people, still being God's chosen people, whether they recognized his son or not, more of this was pointed out to us in Romans 9 and 10, as well as other passages in Scripture, which you're free to read on your own time as to why they have been set aside with spiritual blindness for a time until the beginning of the Great Tribulation where they'll be anointed once again to share his gospel. Again, we'll discuss this in a future study. But this Tanakh, this Hebrew to English rendition, this is a literal word-for-word -word translation of the Hebrew text and the most reliable historical accounts directly translated into English with their closest equivalent. So if it sounds a little jumbly or odd, when rendered in English, that's because of the language barriers. It's like uh, I've uh, taken it on myself as an otaku to learn the Japanese language, and if I'm going to be watching the subtitles, I don't have to anymore because I can understand the basic concepts. But if I were to demonstrate to you, like for example, my name is Sean, Watashi wa Sean des, the literal rendition of that in English would be identifying myself, I, Sean, am, is specifically regarding the conjugation that would identify me and ownership. So if I were to take this word for word, you can tell why the subtitles sometimes take liberty to make something more dramatic, sometimes in unhelpful ways in adding profanity, vulgarity, and language when it no longer existed, but that's just one more reason to learn the language. I use this often in my study and research, not only for my students here at church, but as well for you, to get an understanding of what the original words and translation was to make sure that they're sticking originally to the text because no translation is going to be perfect. And it's important to recognize that your preference isn't going to have every answer. But I want to read to you chapter 11 and verse 1 of the book of Hosea to actually point out to you the significance of this passage and how it directly ties back not only to episode 4, but as well as confirming Christianity. If we have any Jewish audience that's listening here today, and of which I am incredibly honored that you would spend the time listening to this. Now, Hosea chapter 11 says, I fell in love with Israel when he was still a child. I have called him my son ever since Egypt. Now, this is the literal Hebrew to English translation, and it goes on in chapter 11 to emphasize the wanderings in the wilderness and the events in the book of Numbers that ultimately caused them to fall away. That's what the book of Hosea is, calling back a rebellious Israel to a relationship with him. So God is expressing his love for Israel even in its earliest stages and when it was a child, quote unquote, as a nation, I called him out as my son. Now, how does this tie in in a messianic prophecy? Well, the benefit of hindsight that when he was a child, Jesus 
fled to Egypt and under those circumstances was then called back to Israel after a short time in a sense of exile from his own nation because of a cruel king and cruel leadership. Those of you who know Jewish history, you would know that Israel originally made his camp in Canaan, but then when Joseph was sold into slavery in the book of Genesis, we did a study on this going just directly through the Bible for context, he was spent there to spend a time, a grand total of 430 years, all of him and his descendants. No, Joseph didn't live that long, but <laughs> Israel as a whole endured in Egypt before Moses came to call them out. And in a sense, Jesus not only was a direct fulfillment of this following the example of Israel as a whole historically, but Hosea, in a sense, gave a prophecy in not only short term, but long term in what the Messiah's life would be fulfilled. And how's this tied to episode four? Being left in a desert world was called out as a child to fulfill his ultimate purpose and be amongst his people, his family, his Jedi ancestors once again. So you can see some parallels to be certain. And we're also given details about the place of his birth. I'll just go into it briefly in Micah chapter 5, verses 1 through 2. This is the prophecies of Micah. And by the way, for those of you who've seen the expanse of the book of Isaiah, history and prophecy and the establishment of all these kingdoms and proclamations against nations that don't even exist anymore as a nation today because the prophecies came true. <laughs> Micah is, in a sense, the Reader's Digest condensed version of Isaiah, but it goes out to point to us the birthplace of the Messiah as being the most significant sign as to how the Jews would recognize their Savior when he came. And you, O Bethlehem of Ephrath, least among the clans of Judah, from you one shall come forth to rule Israel for me, God speaking, whose origin is from old, from ancient times. Now this language would suggest even such a expanse in ancient lore as being from everlasting, which is how the New King James renders it. Now this being no shortage of a very strong hint towards who this individual would be that came out of Bethlehem, that he would be Emmanuel, our God with us, which again, if you read the book of Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, Isaiah points this out. All of these things are given referencing to the Messiah in the Jewish sources. And in these folklores, in these prophetic utterances that were inspired from the Holy Spirit, we get a specific location of a unique birth, but he wouldn't stay there. He would be moved to an isolated and desert place for a time, but then taken back into his nation once again until he would be prepared and given the opportunity to grow and develop until he was ready at such a time to be called by God to take up this mantle. Not unlike Luke, who though he was born in Polis Massa, on that little asteroid medical facility, for those of you who haven't played Battlefront 2, <laughs> then moved to Tatooine until he was called back again to Yavin and eventually to Hoth and Dagobah and so on and so forth, where he would then refound the Jedi Order. All these things being pointed out to us is very significant indeed. Now, the second event, I want to read to you the next uh, two verses. Matthew 2, 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, he didn't hear back from them, they weren't responding to his text, was exceedingly angry. And he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all of its districts from two years and under. So this gives us a hint as to how long he waited until he figured the wise men had pulled a fast one and caught on to his scheme just to assassinate the king so that he would be the one on the throne. According to the time which had been determined from the wise men, then it was fulfilled that was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted, because they are no more. Well, that's the direct reading of the passage from my translation. Let's go to the Tanakh and see if they're not blowing just hot air towards us. This is Jeremiah 31 and verse 15. All right, thus says the Lord, A cry is heard in Ramah, wailing, bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children. Rachel was the mother of the Jewish people, the wife of 
uh, Israel, Jacob. She refuses to be comforted for her children who are gone. Now, verse 16, and I'll read it to you just to provide context. Thus says the Lord, Restrain your voice from weeping, your eyes from shedding tears, for there is a reward for your labor, declares the Lord. They shall return from the enemy's land. Now, Jeremiah was written at a time in Israel's history when they were going into exile and when the Babylonians would be allowed to overthrow and overtake the city of Jerusalem not only would women be ravaged and men would be slaughtered but even infants would not be spared they'd have their heads crushed on rocks this was a common practice of the pagan nations after taking over a city and even worse for the Assyrians of which whom they were spared from but with all of these things being pointed out to us Aside from the horrible heartache that was going to be presented during this time in history, what is Jeremiah referring to? That there would be a time coming very soon. Now note, Jeremiah 31 was written several years before the Babylonians would even perform a blockade, let alone threaten the nation of Israel. And he was saying, look, these people are going to take us over because of your idolatry and your rejection of God. His protection is lifted. And they're like, Jeremiah, you're kidding. We got the temple. That's all we need. Uh, there's Christians in this country. Doesn't mean we'll ever get invaded. I mean, God will protect us, right? I mean, why would he let a Christian nation? Dang it. You see the point? Well, Jeremiah is speaking about the deaths of these children, but you see that just like in Hosea, there's a dual parallel, there's a dual fulfillment, both short-term and long-term prophecy, that this would not only be circumstances that would be coming soon upon Israel because of their rejection of God himself, but because of the birth of the Messiah, there would also be these things. And again, Matthew looks upon these in hindsight and says, oh my gosh, that's what that passage was talking about, not just what was happening then but would soon be happening later in the future. And you see passages like this in, well, throughout Isaiah, but you see it in Isaiah 7, 14. You see it in Isaiah 7, 6. You see all these, uh, Isaiah 9, 6, rather. You see all these amazing allusions, demonstrations, and illustrations that ultimately turn out to be prophetic when you examine the life of Jesus and realize, oh my gosh, that was on purpose. Over 300 prophecies being fulfilled with the T in Jesus' life. And you need to recognize these as no short of significant because, again, all of these confirmations in hindsight really point out to us what these things mean. But also knowing the benefit of hindsight, do you see maybe what George Lucas and the writers had in mind when these things were being written as far as why Luke would have to leave Tatooine? Why did Jesus return to Egypt? Because of the massacre of all those innocent Jawas, the little ones and as well his foster parents having no reason anymore to stay. That push to fulfill his destiny. I love this. Now, verse 19. Now when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, who, and for those who sought the young child's life are dead. Then he arose, took the child and his mother, and came to the land of Israel. Uh, but when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea instead of his father Herod, little genealogy there, he was afraid to go there, and being warned by God in a dream, he, returned, he turned aside to the region of Galilee, and he came to that and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Now, just for time's sake, if you want to read about the Nazarite vow, Numbers chapter 6, verses 1 through 21, I won't read it to you, but it's essentially an emphasis on the Nazarene vow. The city of Nazareth was founded on that, being dedicated or set aside for God. And a person who would take a Nazarite vow, you know an example like Samson, he would be required to do three things. One, don't cut your hair. That's why Jesus and Luke were both shown stereotypically, though they were dudes, they had long hair. That's because they wouldn't cut it. That's also why Jesus is rendered with a beard, because he uh, would be set aside for God. He wouldn't shave. He wouldn't touch wine. They would, they would be required to stay away from things that could take your influence and mind and attention away from God and onto the things of the world. And as well, 
four time you would be required that during that Nazarite vow not to touch a dead thing. And then number six goes on. If you come into it accidentally or unwittingly, then you just say your Nazarite vow is voided, and then you just start over whenever you feel yourself ready to do that again. And while the Nazarite vow was a notably temporary oath, it would be the reality of Jesus' life, an explanation as to why he was born in Bethlehem, raised in Egypt, but ultimately grew up in Nazareth. The Nazarite vow would be the definition of Jesus' character, but isn't that interesting? When Jesus left Egypt, he was going to go to Judea, but his dad detoured because there was still a lot of danger there. There was nothing for them to stay there. It was all destroyed. It was all taken over by some other king who was not as cruel, but still a little crazy, like his dad, Herod, and went instead to Nazareth. When Luke left Tatooine, he was supposed to go to Alderaan, but after a detour, having no reason to stay there because it was a freaking asteroid field, they went to Yavin. Ooh, I love this. All right, now, um, skipping ahead a few verses into chapter 3 of Luke, the first 12 verses are actually a summary of John the Baptist ministry, who is a noted illustration and example of Obi-Wan Kenobi. And I'll just read the passage to you. I'll start in verse 7, in fact, because the first six verses are just a discussion of the prophecies surrounding John the Baptist's birth. If you want to read them, you can look up Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3 that is quoted there. And as well how John also took the Nazarite vow and his uh, diet was very fun. He was an outdoorsman, to be sure. But when he was preaching about the kingdom of heaven being on its way. He was, in a sense, the last of the Old Testament prophets before the coming and fulfillment of Messiah. He said something very interesting. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, the materialists and the people who used religion for a prophet instead of the actual benefit to their lives, coming to his baptism, he said to them, brood of vipers. Literally, in modern-day vernacular, that would be, you sons of snakes. This, remember, this guy's noted by Jesus as being no one born of woman, as greater than John the Baptist. So is using those terms a sin, or is it not always what we think it is? Anyway, just a snide note. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not think to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. God doesn't need you. He could tell rocks to be his kids, and they would listen. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water under repentance. But note, he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. I'm not worthy to touch that guy's feet. He will baptize you, note this, with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, basically a long-distance broom, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor, referring to the removal of all leavened bread before a Passover ceremony to get all sin and all things meaningless out of his home, and gather his wheat, the profitable fruit, into the barn, and, but he will burn up the chaff, the useless stuff, with unquenchable fire. So John's call to recognize the Messiah here as he would appear and what his purpose was going to be to bring in the new covenant and to bring in the new kingdom that was promised to them in the books of Isaiah chapters 40 through 66, or basically all the Old Testament prophets, in fact. There's an interesting thing to point out here, because while John the Baptist could definitely be an illustration of Obi-Wan, that while he wasn't the chosen one, he was set there in advance to prepare the way for Luke, that even though the sand people were about, he was there to make sure everything would go smoothly and come into place. When he would appear and fulfill his purpose, he prepared the way for him, and he would call him out into what he was meant to do. And even though, in this case, Luke was reluctant to follow him until the massacre of the Jawas and his parents came, Luke, in a sense, was the antithesis to this because it was actually John the Baptist 
who was reluctant to baptize Jesus. I'll read to you verse 13. When Jesus came from Galilee to John of the Jordan to be baptized by him, John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and are you coming to me? I can't go to Alderaan with you. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he allowed him. Then when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alight, alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So the Holy Spirit and the Father, both separate members of the Trinity, but equal in status with Jesus as God, the whole Trinity meets here and saying, now we have called and have been anointed with the full power of the force, in this case, to fulfill your mission and role as Messiah. Now here's the interesting thing. When Jesus was baptized and the Holy Spirit came upon him, the Father acknowledged his role and mission. And essentially, the one that was promised to us in Daniel 9 was fulfilled. I'd like to read to you that passage because I just love it so much. This is Daniel chapter 9. This is known as the 70 weeks prophecy. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24. The Messiah's mission. 70 weeks have been decreed for your people and for your holy city until the measure of transgression is filled and that of sin complete. Again, I'm reading out of the Tanakh here, not the New Testament. Now, recognize this because this is important. The 70 weeks, we'll talk about this when we get into Daniel. If you can't wait that long, leave in the comments below. I'll be happy to tell you. He's predicting to the day when Jesus would make his entry into Jerusalem. The overall plan that God has for Israel would be in a set of 70 years of weeks. The original language would suggest that. Until the trans measure of transgression is filled and that of sin complete. Now, here was the Messiah's mission. Until iniquity is expiated and eternal righteousness is ushered in. The prophetic vision ratified and the holy of holies anointed. Now, these would be all terms to recognize that not only would these be fulfilling the role of ending sin's power over us, which was death, but the Messiah's also mission was to reintroduce and restore our relationship with God. All these things were pointed out to us in that being the Messiah's mission. This would be the full completion of God's plan. But let me run through that again. To remove the power of death from mankind and to restore life to the universe once again. What was Luke's destiny? What was his goal to accomplish in Star Wars Episode Four? It was to, as the Chosen One, destroy the Death Star end the reign of the Sith, and in one shot, restore the Jedi Order to the galaxy. But, we only saw half of those fulfilled in Episode 4, didn't we? There was still more left to be fulfilled. And that's the interesting thing. There were two messiahs written about in these Old Testament prophets. There, were, there was the Suffering Servant, written about in Psalm 22, and rejected and hated and despised by men in Isaiah 53. And there was also the conquering king, the one that would be anointed to destroy death's power over our souls forever, and the one anointed to destroy Israel's oppressors forever. Now we need to note and recognize this, that Jesus, by all means, and by every mean, in fact, the one mean that counted, he came and destroyed the Death Star that was keeping us all in the grip of fear. But the Empire still remains. Jesus will one day return to establish the new kingdom, but now we know what our new hope really is. That although we were simply waiting for the promises and prophecies of the Force to fulfill themselves in their own time, now we can know not only from the Jewish sources, but the Christian current ones as well, that these things have not been left told to us by accident, that these things have literally been fulfilled, that these things have literally been demonstrated, and that we even have illustrations today, like Star Wars, that point out to us just what a miracle this all was. Jesus destroyed the Death Star. The enemy can't hold that over our lives anymore, but it only comes through trusting and siding with him. And of that, I encourage you 
to take that leap and understand what this message was all about. Thank you for your time listening to the study. I hope it's been a blessing to you. If you have questions about the topics discussed or maybe other themes in Star Wars that you would like answered, I'd be happy to uh, answer them if you leave them in the comments below. If you have any questions about the Old Testament and the uh, passages in the Tanakh and the differences between the New Testament and Old Testament we have today, the differences between translations and why the relevancy would be included, I'd be happy to answer those questions as long as they are sincere. But most importantly, regardless of even encouraging this ministry, if you know someone who perhaps is a fan of Star Wars but doesn't know the one who it was based on, who perhaps hasn't seen these stories pointed out to them before and the parallels therein, please share the study with anyone and everyone that you would feel would be blessed by it. Thank you for your time while listening to this study. And remember, Jesus loves you, and he'll always be with you. Always.